I am starting into, I, I was debating how long to do the strange stories from a strange book about a strange God. Uh, and as you get into the New Testament, we've, we've been kind of working through the Bible cover to cover. But as you get into the New Testament, a lot of the New Testament is um, not stories, it's, it's epistles. And I think so often the things that are the story are stories that we have heard a lot. And so I didn't know how much time I wanted to spend in them, but there's this, there's this passage of scripture that has always kind of perplexed me. And to be honest with you, I've just not really spent a lot of time dealing with it simply because I didn't know what to do with it. Um, and so I thought, you know what? Let's talk about that. So I say all of that to say, this is, this is an odd passage of Scripture because in general, when you interpret Scripture, you should not ever pull out a, something that isn't corroborated somewhere else and build theology on it. That gets you into trouble. Scripture, scripture backs up Scripture. A and yet this passage of Scripture has something in it that isn't seen anywhere else, that's not talked about anywhere else. And it just kind of makes me scratch my head. And so there are specifics about this, um, and we're in the Gospel of Matthew. I mentioned that we're going to be at the, toward the end of Matthew, Matthew 27, the crucifixion of Christ. All four Gospel accounts talk about the crucifixion of Christ. All four Gospel accounts tell basically the same story. Matthew is the only one that records one specific incident. And so I'm not going to talk just about that incident because it's bigger than that, but I do want to highlight it briefly because it just makes me scratch my head. So if you have your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 27, I'm going to be starting in verse 50 and reading through 54. Um, at just kind of, it's at the very tail end of the crucifixion. As a matter of fact, the first verse, verse 50, is where Christ himself actually gives up his life. He dies. So Matthew chapter 27, verses, verses 50 through 54 say this. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and rocks split. And the tombs broke open and bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and were seen and, and went about the holy city and appeared to many people. Verse 54. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, surely he was the son of God. Now, several years ago, John Piper tackled uh, this passage, and he came up with seven points that he wanted to highlight. And um, I think that's, well, in, in John Piper form, he gets a lot of detail and a lot of, of meat out of a passage. I'm not going to have seven points today. Um, and I actually included an extra verse. He stopped at 53, and I want to just briefly move on to 54. But ever since I, I read the article that he had published about this, I've been intrigued by this passage, by the fact that nowhere else in all of Scripture, none of the other Gospels talk about the tombs being opened. And as, as Matthew puts it, um, many holy people who had died were raised to life. Nowhere else. So I want to talk about that just, just briefly. But before we get to that, I want to start and just go through some of the things that we see at the actual point of death, when Christ died. The very first thing we see is it says that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now, if you're familiar with the temple, if you're familiar with the construction, from, from way back when God gave plans for the tabernacle, even though there have been, uh, there was the 
tabernacle, and then there was the temple, and then the temple was destroyed, and the temple was rebuilt. So we've gone through various forms of this, but it has always remained the same as far as the, the interior design goes. There is a place called the holy place, and then there is a, another room beyond that that's called the holy of holies, and nobody could go into the Holy of Holies except the high priest, and he could only go in once a year. Now, inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark of the Covenant. That's the, there were the cherubim, and that, that was God's resting place. That's where God sat. That's where God came to dwell among the Israelites. This was, quite literally, as its name states, the holiest place there is. The high priest could only go in after sacrificing for his own sin, to cover his own sin. Then he could go in with blood as a sacrifice for the rest of the nation. But it was was a a once-a-year event where someone was going in to ask for forgiveness, to seek forgiveness for everyone's sin. No one else had access to that place. No one else could go there. And when Jesus died, and it's, it's significant that, that the, the veil was torn, the, so the holy place and the most holy place, or the holy of holies, there was this thick, heavy veil that hung between the two rooms. That's what separated them. And we we're told that it was torn from top to bottom. Now this is a big, thick piece of fabric. This isn't something that you just, you know, you grab and just tear. But even if it were, It's significant that it was torn from top to bottom. It's as if God reached down and opened up the Holy of Holies. Now, we have, in in our area, we have, there's not too far from here, there's BJ's, there's Sam's Club, there's a few Sam's Club in the area, and there's a Costco over on the East Shore. My personal favorite is Costco. I've been a member of Costco for a long time. BJ's, you can go in, It's a members-only club, but you can go in even if you're not a member. Sam's, you can go in even if you're not a member. You can't buy anything. You can't really do anything. But Costco, and I could never understand this, Costco, they check to see if you have a membership card before you're allowed in the door. To me, that's bad business. I would think that you should want people to come in and see what they're missing out on. But at Costco, you cannot get in if you don't have a membership. I belong to a sportsman's club. I have a gate key, an electronic gate key. You cannot get in to the sportsman's club if you're not a member. I can get in. I'm a member. The Holy of Holies was a place that nobody could get into except the high priest, and then only once a year. And then he was actually risking his life going in there because if he went in in an unpure, unclean, unworthy way, It could cost him his life. When Christ died on the cross, his death provided spiritual victory. We are no longer, there is no longer a need for us to be spiritually separated from God. The Holy of Holies is opened up. We can approach God directly because of the work of the cross because of the work that was accomplished at Jesus' death. We are told that by, by one man, sin came into the world and death with him. So also, through death, one man made atonement for all. We are all given the opportunity to approach God because of Christ and his death. Jesus himself said in John 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way, the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. Now, it would be easy to read that and say that Jesus is our high priest, and we have to go through him, and that is true. But in doing that, he doesn't go into God and say, no, 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 you need to stay out there. He welcomes us in with him. If you're not a member of Costco, you can go with me, and I can get you in there. I'm welcome. Jesus is always welcome in the Father's presence. 
And when we go with Jesus, he says, no, 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 it's okay. They can come in. We have been given access directly to the most holy place. What a phenomenal gift. Again, Jesus' own words in John 10, he says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. It's not Jesus going in for us. It's Jesus allowing us to come in through him. They will come and go and find pasture. It's a promise for all that we need. The author of Hebrews, the entire book of Hebrews is written from the standpoint of Jesus is better. Jesus is better than, and he compares, Jesus is better than the, than the angels. Jesus is better than all the rest of humanity. Jesus is better than any other high priest. Jesus is better than fill in the blank. Jesus is better. The author of Hebrews in, in chapter 6, uh, verses 19 and 20 says this, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus gives us access to God. Jesus, our high priest, invites us in with him. So the curtain temple was, the curtain in the temple was torn from top to bottom. But it also says in Matthew chapter 27 that the earth shook and rocks split. The Greek word used here for rock splitting is the same exact Greek word that was used for the temple veil being torn. And I don't think that's by accident. I think Matthew wants us to see that these two things, while they look vastly different, there's this event that happened in the temple, and then there's this, this thing that's happening in nature. There's an earthquake, and these rocks are breaking apart. He says, they're connected. Jesus died, and the temple veil was torn, and the earth shook, and the rocks split. It's all connected. Christ's death was the single most impactful event in all of history, ever since the creation of the world. Now, rocks do split. I was, I was hunting um, down in Larry Brothers' house, and I came across this huge, I, I climbed up on top of it, this big rock that quite frankly was, uh, I'm gonna say probably four or five feet high, seven or eight feet wide. Right in the middle of it, there's a tree growing out of it. Nature can split nature. We've seen that, but it's a slow, gradual process. This was an event not a happening. Christ died. The earth trembled. The earth quaked, shook, and rocks split. Naaman, in Naaman chapter one, uh, he, rec- he recounts this. He says, the mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence, the world and all who live in it. God, the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things has power over all things. And at the death of Christ, it was such a cataclysmic event that the very foundations, things that we think of as foundational, things that can always be just, it's just assumed that it's going to happen. There's always going to be an earth, right? No. Things, Things that we assume are foundational tremble. Rocks split. Again, the author of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 12, starting verse 26, says this, at that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. The words once more indicate, indicate the removing of what can be shaken, that is, created things so that what cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. 
God will one, one day consume all of that which is temporary. But here at, at the death of Christ, when we see him do the work that he, was, that he came here to do, when we see him pay for the sin of mankind, we see the beginning of the end of the effects of sin. It all shook. And the author of Hebrews says that what, what's shaken is everything that can be shaken. It's going to all pass away. What's going to remain is what is permanent. I'm so thankful that because of Christ's death on the cross, I have an opportunity to enter into that holy place, to experience new life, to be given a relationship with God. Because I too, like the earth and like the rocks, am a created being. I too live in a temporary shell. Paul talks about our, our bodies as being tents. We, we dwell in a tent. In another verse, he, he talks about jars of clay. We live in this temporary dwelling. It will pass away. God, through Christ's death on the cross, has redeemed, has made a way to redeem all of creation. But then we get to that, that weird part in this passage that nobody else talks about. The other gospel writers don't mention it. The tombs broke open. The tombs broke open. There were people who were resurrected at the death of Christ. So often we tie Christ's resurrection to conquering death. And rightfully so, because when Christ was raised, he was raised eternally, never to perish again. But it's actually his death that lays the groundwork for the resurrection. Again, Paul writes in Romans chapter 5, he says, Consequently, just as there is one trans trespass which resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. Just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, the many will be made righteous. What was the obedience of one man? What did Jesus come here to do? To die in my place for me, to take on me all, or take on him all of my sinfulness, to give me all of his righteousness. He lived the perfect life so that when we trade places, God looks at me and sees perfection, sees righteousness. Jesus and I traded places that day. And so there's this, this foreshadowing of what will come because some people were raised from the dead then. And again, the author of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it says, since the, children, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil. When Jesus died, as crazy as it sounds, but his death broke the power of death. Christ's death made it possible for new life. And as a, as a foreshadowing as, of that, as a, an opportunity for us to see a glimpse of that, the tombs broke open. But it wasn't just tombs broke open. It says the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. It doesn't say the spirits. This isn't a disembodied resurrection. The bodies of those who died, of holy ones who died, were raised to life. Again, I, I don't know what my fascination is this week with Costco, maybe because I don't get over there very much. Um, but one of the things that I really miss about Costco right now is, and I hear they've started doing this again, I don't know how that will, that will work, but the samples. 
Kristen and I actually avoid going to Costco on a Sunday, not for religious reasons as much as because there are so many people there. They, people go there after church and eat lunch just on the samples. And it's, it's crazy busy in there. You can get samples. You can get almost enough, and some people do. They actually get enough for a meal. It's just, here, try this, try this. It's, it's an attempt to get you to see how good something really is. And I can't help but think these, it says many people, what, maybe it's what, not thousands, probably not even hundreds, but it was more than just one or two. Many holy people were raised to life and seen by many. Here's a sample of what it's gonna be like. Imagine what it will be like when Christ returns and all of the followers of Christ for all time are raised to meet him, to spend all of eternity with him. It's a foretaste of things to come. That's what we look forward to. That's what we hope for. Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, we know that all of creation has been groaning in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the, who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For it is this hope for in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait patiently. We got to see it, we got a glimpse of it, so that we can anticipate, so that we can hold on to the hope that we have. Our hope is in Jesus Christ and the work that he does. Our hope is in Jesus Christ and the work that he has done. It's accomplished. It's just a matter of hoping, waiting, continuing to follow, anticipating. Now, it's not just all about the future. Christ actually wants us to live full lives here and now. But we live in a fallen, a still fallen world. We live in a world that is still struggling under the effect of sin. It's been beaten it's been defeated, but it's still here. But one day, it will all be set aside. It will all be shaken, and all that is shakable will be gone. We are given the opportunity to have a right relationship with Christ. You see, I, I mentioned earlier that you can come into Costco with me because I'm a member. I invite people. If you want to go, let's talk about it. You can't show up and just say, I want in. You have to go there with a member. You cannot show up at heaven and say, I want in. God the Father will say, sorry, I don't know you. Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ has provided a way, and he holds it out to us as a gift in just a minute, we're going to celebrate communion. Jesus gave his body. He gave his blood. He paid the price so that all who accept it reap all the benefits. I mentioned earlier that Jesus trades places. But it takes a, willing, a willingness on my part. I need to accept that. I need to ask for that. Jesus, will you trade places with me? There is nothing simpler than becoming a follower of Christ. It's simply accepting the, the free gift that Christ has given. That doesn't mean it's easy after the fact. Following Jesus is hard work. But it's work that he does. He calls us to just be willing. Through his spirit working in us, he wants to transform us. He wants to renew us. He wants our lives to be rich, full, and vibrant from an eternal perspective. Christ's death on the cross gave us access directly to God through him. Christ's death on the cross showed the temporariness 
of all of creation as we see it. All this, it's all going to be gone one day. But there will be a resurrection, a bodily resurrection for people who have asked Christ to be their Lord and Savior, for people who have committed their lives to follow him. That's what communion is all about. It's an opportunity for us to connect with God. It's an opportunity for us to spend time with. Communion, commune. Enjoy each other's company. Jesus invites us to the table. He says, come get to know me better. Follow me. Spend time with me. Enjoy my company. That's all wrapped up in his death. Now, I praise God for the resurrection because in the resurrection, we have that confirmation again that all of humanity will be raised the righteous to an eternity with God. Sadly, those who haven't accepted Christ's gift will be raised to an eternity apart from God. Rather than us getting frustrated that there's only one way, and I hear people say Christianity's kind of closed-minded, isn't it? There's only one way to God. Well, Jesus' words I read earlier, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Jesus said, I am the gate. There is a way. We celebrate that. That is so exciting. Jesus has provided a way. But in, in um, again, the end of 1 Corinthians, Paul spends a good deal of time talking about the resurrection. And he says, so will it, it will be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown imperishable will be raised will be raised imperishable. The body that is sown in dishonor will be raised in glory, sown in weakness, raised in power, sown in the natural body, raised in the spiritual body. It goes on later and he says, oh, he says, death, where is your victory? The grave, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. Christ paid the price so that death no longer holds a grip on us. It says, thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I thank you that you have provided a way. Lord, I thank you that you have made a a way for us to follow, closely follow Jesus into your presence. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you made that way possible through your death. You call us to a life connected to you, abiding in you, remaining in you. But you do, you call us to life. That is your desire for us. And I pray that we would follow you closely, that we would walk with you continually, and we would fellowship with you intimately. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.